In my name. There's pleasures that a home cooked, cooked meal could never even compare to. <laughs> Man, it's crazy how lofty we set our, our sights, you know. Parabosa darinin, chi topora, malanina mastaya, torisikina. Oh, Ramon Basebruta, daily me. I just, you know, I'm going to continually put you in remembrance of these things, stir you up, put you in remembering, remembrance of these things, lest at any time you might let them slip. I don't want you to let them slip. We want you to understand what Father has given us a mandate to do. And you know, people just want to, people just, they want to be constantly reaffirmed that they're doing well. Hey, man, you know what? Quit being so insecure. Oh, please tell me I'm doing good. Quit being so, so insecure. Amen. If you don't, if, if no one reproves you, how are you ever going to learn how to do what's right? How are you going to recognize you're doing something wrong? Huh? But if that person who's off in reproof, if he stiffens his neck, he, he, ultimately what's going to happen is there's going to be destruction should come upon him suddenly and that without remedy. I want to be instructed. I signed up to be taught of God. God chastens, reproves every one of his children. Come on, Lord. Man, I'm telling you. I love the reproofs of the Lord. <laughs> I, want, I, want to, I want to teach you how to live in a, a place of relationship with the Lord where there is a call to prayer and you can recognize a call to prayer. Yeah. Holy Ghost calls us to pray. Yes. He calls us. We set our time clocks and all of our calendars and because if we don't, we'll forget because we don't, we're not don't understand how to, how to really have that intimacy of interaction with him. But we can teach you, we'll show you how this, you know, as we've been taught of the Lord, how that this, go ahead and respond to the Holy Ghost, you know, when he calls us to prayer. You know, have you ever gotten hit? Just out of nowhere, just out of us about an end. I wonder what that is. Huh? Oh, he says, oh, thank you, Lord, for making intercession. Praise God. Praying while I'm on the run. He's actually calling you to prayer. He's actually calling you to prayer. If you could just stop. He, he stop. Stop. What you're doing. Let that now, because it's just flowing out just without any e effort. Just imagine what's going to happen when you put your whole attention now. Direct your whole attention into that call to prayer. And then the Lord knows he, that you respond when he calls you to prayer. Your whole life would change. We make it so complicated, so easy. We make it about something that is more ritual than relationship. And the beauty is relationship. Where God the Holy Ghost comes and begins to pray through me. God the Holy Ghost comes and gives me longings which cannot be uttered. Longings. Longings. Deep hunger. Longing. Lord, I pant for you as a dear pants with water book. You know, you know, really... <clears throat> You don't make yourself thirsty. You know what makes you thirsty? A healthy body makes you thirsty. It's true. You don't make yourself hungry. You know what makes you hungry? A healthy body makes you hungry. Because if you get bad sick, you, you lose your appetite. You can get depressed and not want to eat and not drink nothing. Huh? And it's the same thing with the spirit and the soul. A healthy spirit will cause you to be hungry and thirsty. A healthy soul will cause you a hunger and thirst and, and, and have a deep love and affection and passion for only one thing, that which is reality. Because it don't take long. You basically keep putting your finger there in the light socket and keep getting shocked or sticking your hand there in the bear trap and keep getting it broke. After a while, you can say, man, I'll tell you, that bear trap looks good. You know, but I'm tired of the pain it produces. Uh -huh. And then you start saying, oh, God, teach me wisdom and give me knowledge. And then out of that should come understanding. You know what wisdom and knowledge would do? It would give you the ability to practice it. Understanding is the ability to implement that which you know. Ha. Huh. To implement how to stand against all these things. To implement how to walk against disease and sickness. Ha. Huh. To implement uh, how to stand against sin and iniquity. To implement uh, how, to, how to have passions and develop passions and emotions and desires that are all holy. Whew. Wow. 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 Is it possible? Yeah. 
Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may, may devour. But God goes about uh, with, with his eyes searching to and fro, seeing whom he might empower. <laughs> that's what God, that's what the Lord says. Everybody's all, ah, thank God God's for our lives. He's made the power. He's got a bunch of stuff I want. How about when he ain't got a bunch of stuff you want anymore? <laughs> How about now all of a sudden all you conscious of his eyes go to and fro? <laughs> Seeking whom he may in power. And then there's like, God's got everything you want. God's got everything you want. I want you to taste and see that God's got everything that you want. Come taste of his pleasure. Mm -hmm. Come taste of his goodness. <laughs> How about I tell you? Come taste of his faithfulness. You know, I, I, was, I, was, you know, I was saying this morning, a concerning person, well, I'm glad you're my friend because I don't really have a lot of them. People are more scared and intimidated of me than they are, you know, anything else. And I don't know why. It just... I, shouldn't be. Well, I'm afraid to, I was afraid to call you, Pastor. Why? Because you're busy. What does that have to do with anything? What am I busy about? The kingdom. Is this, a, is this an issue regarding the kingdom of God? You know, so it's, it's, it's not a problem. And if you have to leave a voice message, we will get to you. You promise you queued up. Believe me. And the Lord said, no, no, no. You're forgetting something. I'm your friend. I laid everything aside. I said, <laughs> I'm sorry. Because <laughs> we, we forget he's not in the visible realm. We want somebody visible there we can handle because we want to make it all sensual. There's something deeper than sensual. There's something deeper than what you can see. What you see with your eyes is a very limited realm of existence. Father wants to teach you a much superior realm of existence. What you feel with your hands is a limited realm of existence with a limited realm of understanding. What you understand with your heart is a limited realm. Most people don't understand much. Huh? And you start understanding something and you die. Right? You, and that's if you live to be about 90 years old. Finally, you understand and boom, you're dead. <laughs> What profit is there in that? The preacher says, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. I mean, you can have all the understanding, all the knowledge, all the importance, all the skill set you can imagine. And then boom, you die. And then find out that, wait a minute, this, it was for naught. It was for nothing. Because, I, because as soon as I got it, no sooner did I get it understanding and begin to comprehend a little bit and, and, and my life passed away. And so the sum, of, so the the preacher says, rather he says, the sum of it all, the sum of everything, the totality of all the wisdom and insight that you need to know of what you should really focus on is to fear the Lord, to hate and excuse evil, skew it, huh? Fight against it, have a have a have a venom and anger against it, huh? To obey the Lord, do what He says. Obey the Lord and do what He says. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then you go ahead and joy and rejoice. Well, I was waiting for the Lord to come and strike me with a lightning bolt right at the top of my head because I don't have anything to joy and rejoice about. I mean, I need a super download of, of unimaginable grace and power to be able to joy and rejoice. You do. <laughs> There's something seriously wrong. You need a changed heart then. Because the changed heart of the redeemed of the Lord's return come with singing and design. And then gave, me, gave you a garment, a mantle of praise for that old spirit of heaviness. Amen. Come. Hallelujah. What's that, baby? Everlasting joys on your head. It is. You tell on yourself if you're in His presence because in His presence is fullness of joy. Somebody said, well, I want to be in his presence. If I was, you see, that's right. You're confirming, you're confirming my fear that, I, that he don't like me and that he refused to let me in his presence. No, 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 no. It's not true. You're taking it wrong. No one's confirming your fear. 
We're trying to confirm your love. <laughs> because it really is an act of your own will. It's an act of your will to say yes, Lord. Yes. To say yes, I will do it. That's an act of your will. The Lord doesn't come and move your mouth. Huh? He doesn't come and make you do these things. Papa doesn't make us a puppet on a string. He says, just, I'm going to give you all this. Now, what are you going to do with it? Sitting on the pile of riches, sitting on a mountain of riches, <laughs> talking and saying, woe is me, poor, 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 poor me. You're sitting on a pile of riches, man. Get up and spend it. Do something with it. Pick it up. Move out in this faith realm. This takes too much energy to have faith. I have to deal with my fears to have faith. I have to embrace uncertainties to have faith. I have to step out beyond the limits of that which I'm comfortable with to have faith. I have to trust in God instead of the arm of flesh to have faith. It's okay. Practice makes perfect. And then suddenly you find that faith is a realm that's easy. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that are having problems, having faith. All you that are weary and heavy laden. Come over here, enter into the rest, now the realm of faith. Hallelujah. Ah, hallelujah. You should find rest for your soul. So, mama, take, take my servitude upon you for my yoke. My servitude is easy. Uh, walking in this faith realm of walking on the water and multiplying the loaves and the fishes. Believe in Father for everything, even when you have nowhere to lay your head. Son of man hath no place to lay his head. Birds of the air have nests. Foxes have holes. The Son of man has no place to lay his head. Come on over here. My yoke is easy. Can you just think about how many people would be blaming God and accusing God? If they had no place to lay their head. Oh, God, you promised. Oh, God, you said. No, I did. And you did it. Nonsense. There's a relationship with the Lord. That all you need, all the comfort you need, all the love you need, all the joy you need, all the pleasure you need, all the life you want, all that you desire is found in His presence. Doing the will of the Father. Doing it, doing it means that you do it. You do it. Huh. 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 You're not a dead body that God comes and inhabits and gets you up and moving and he's doing it. And you, you do it. You keep yourself. Amen. You present yourself. Who saw by you? Uh, you present yourself a living sacrifice. I want to present myself a sacrifice to God that's going to be holy and acceptable and that's joyful. And that's, every, and that's full of love and grace and mercy. That's every other thing he describes. People make it, make it something that's not because Satan's constantly running interference. I know, what Father, I know what Father delights in. He said it over and over again. It's no mistake. But it's you and I who do, are willing to do it. Huh? It's you and I when we begin to deal with maybe sickness in the body. We, we, we decide whether we're going to run to the doctor or we're going to run to the Lord. And let faith be developed. Some said, ah, oh, he's against the doctors. Now, I'm for God. Can I, talk, can I talk about what we're for here? I'm for faith. Why does it, do, why, huh? why does it work that way that everything gets turned upside down? Why, why is people here wrong? Why is a lying spirit allowed to work in people's thoughts and thinking and eardrums when the truth is going forth? See, we devoted to seeing that stuff stopped so people can hear the truth. But you find a place in God to where that you would rather, you rather die than not trust Him. And that's where you then begin to find that place where you begin to pray continually. Lord, strengthen my body to be able to stand against sickness and disease. Lord, strengthen my spirit to be able to stand against sin and iniquity. Oh, God, strengthen my soul to love only you. Find all my, all, all that I have a desire of, all my emotions all in holy emotions all my passions and pleasures only found in you I want no I don't want to teach myself or train myself to find pleasure in the world because then I'm being taught and trained wrong 
I want to I want to be taught to reject any pleasures that are in the world recognizing that all it is is destruction and death I want God to teach me however to have holy emotions to find all my pleasures in him pleasures that go beyond anything that re re belongs to a this present evil age and evil world and then when we're willing to do that, he says, okay, I'll show you. Let me, let me, let me show you some pleasures. Come with me. <laughs> Watch this. Let me show you. And he begins to call us into a realm that we don't even, we can't even begin to comprehend with our thinking. We, we think of prayer as something that, you know, just kind of like imposes itself upon our time. And, and, and you know, and kind of gets in the way of all of that we need to get done. Now, Pop wants to show you a place that you're like, woo hoo I get to do this. This is, do we have to, I have to go? Can, can I stay right here? Huh? That's what, that was what happened with Moses. what he entered into when he went up upon the mountain. He said, no, I'm not going anywhere unless you go. A fellowship. Somebody said, how can you pray, pray continually? Because you fellowship and continually. Huh? Because you, how, how can you pray without ceasing? Because you're, you're in an interaction without ceasing. You're just like over in this realm of divine goodness and glory. You're in the presence. Whew. There is a hurting, dying world around us where people are just vexed and empty and so in pain inside. If they could just see God's people walking around filled up and complete and made perfect in Him, lacking nothing. Oh, the style of Satoya. Father, we, you know, this is, our prayer, this is our plea. This is our prayer. Father, we want to go everywhere and change the atmosphere because we should invade the atmosphere. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and you and I are commanded to cast him out. We should go and invade the atmosphere. We should drive back the pain and the suffering and the lust. Here's what happens. People go in to different places, and now they're basically impacting or interacting with the things that are going on in folks' life. Maybe a person got a stronghold of fear in their life, and all of a sudden you come under fear. Maybe a person got a stronghold of lust in life. All of a sudden you come under the lust. Maybe a person got a stronghold of doubt and unbelief or cursing in life, and you suddenly you begin to be impacted by that. And if you're not careful, if there's any affinity for the pleasures of this world or for the things of this world, you'll get drawn into it, begin to participate with it. You can't change the atmosphere when you're participating with that thing. It's impossible. Suddenly now, You've been strengthened in your soul now to only love pleasures that belong to the right hand in, in his presence at his right hand. You're strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord now where you, all, all your desires are in him. Holy emotions is all that you gravitate to. And now those things come at you and you don't interact with them. They come and you just you know that it's going on right over there or it's going on right over here. Because now discernment is working. You're not thinking, well, this is something I want. Wait a minute. So you, know, you don't even want it. You're over here. That's something that's coming from of a, in the a, a realm of a person's stronghold or a bondage or a cry of the enemy trying to destroy someone's life. And now you actually invade the atmosphere and drive it back. Suddenly now they get to be, be instead of you experiencing what they're experiencing and you thinking what's going on in their life through demonic activity, all of a sudden they begin to experience what you're experiencing in the presence of the Lord. And they begin to go on and, and be impacted by divine interaction. And we see this in great revivals of the past. And somebody said, oh, sovereign Lord, do it again. Wait a minute. He's still doing it. It's just that those guys went into a realm in God and a relationship with God that resulted in that kind of activity of the presence of God in their lives. True. True. Hallelujah. I mean, Abraham goes down into Egypt and changes the dreams of Pharaoh. Changes his impacts his dream way he dreams. <laughs> Hallelujah. People, what we're going to do is we're going to help you understand a salvation that causes and produces repentance. Uh, we're going to cause you to understand a walk with God that results in the glory of heaven being made manifested in your life. Love you, buddy. Good to see you. Heaven being made manifested in your life. And somebody said, oh, you've been talking about that for 30 years now. Well, you guess what? For the next 30 years, I'll be talking about it. I mean, I'm, 
praying for 40, 50 more. I figured I'd been talking to the Lord about, hey, you know, Lord, it'd be a great sign and wonder. I don't, I, Lord, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay. Because, see, the righteous judge is going to bless me with, for something because I love the appearing of the Lord Jesus. I want to be where he's at. Okay? But if, but more than anything else, I want to do the will of the Father and I want to be used by Him in whatever way He wants to use me for this time period because when I'm done being used in this way for this time period, I'm going to go and be used by Him in another way for that other time period. So nothing's changing. Whether I'm here or whether I'm there, I'm right doing whatever it is He wants me to do. Amen. I'm not, gonna, I'm not looking for no couch in a retirement center, a heavenly retirement center where I sit, stare out over the vast expanse of God's creation in all that he has done. I mean, <laughs> wait a minute here. There's a whole lot more going on. Than, than, uh, look, I, I'm not, I just, lazy doesn't work for me anyways. I enjoy moving around and, and, and I've noticed that Father enjoys moving around doing stuff. Look at all that he's done. <laughs> hey man, how long has the Lord been around? Forever. Well, what has he been doing? Take a look. <laughs> and he hadn't stopped. Huh? He hadn't stopped. See, some of you believe, oh, the sun just comes up in the morning and goes down in the evening, you know, because the Lord just put this, you know, physical laws in the place, and that's how it works. And that's not how it works. It's all, everything's obeying his command. Birds chirp at his command. You breathe at his command. In him we move and live and have our being. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? I'm almost finished with the announcements here. So I said, I, I, I'm not coming to your church anymore. I said, why? So you never give announcements. <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. You never give announcements. We never know what's going on. And then, of course, they got to embellish on that because as soon as you say something stupid, you recognize, you're the first one to recognize. You know what I'm saying? If you think stupid, it's like it's okay. But as soon as you say stupid, you recognize you're the first one. <laughs> so they got to embellish on it. Uh, well, I'm just, this is my announcements. And besides that, where does it say in the Bible and think about announcements in church? <laughs> Well, we got to all know what we're doing. I mean, you know, you're going to have to cast a vision. How are we supposed to follow you if, if you, you aren't casting a vision? Here it is. Here it is. The, the vision's done been cast. Somebody said, you need to write the vision so that they read and run with it. He's been written. We are, we are on page here. Somebody said, what are we about? I said, Every, um, our whole name says what we about. Abiding place and ministry. <laughs> John 15, 1 through 7. That's their mission statement. I want you to... Somebody asked me, well, what's that about? Oh, well, you have to understand that. I'm speaking mysteries in the Spirit. But, I'm, but I'm, I deal with different... We, God, the Holy Ghost, deals with different things as they're needed. Hmm? Today, if you are sick in your body, He'll deal with that if you're willing to believe them. So there'll be healing if it's needed. Hmm? There'll be deliverance. There'll be deliverance in the house wherever it's needed. All you got to want is change. Huh? People don't want to die. People, people are like on the verge. They're, here's where they're at. Well, I don't want to die and go to hell. Well, that's good. That's smart. <laughs> that's smart. But... They don't want to be delivered from sin and iniquity. So they're going to, they're going to go ahead and sign up. Oh, okay, I'll take Jesus because I don't want to die and go to hell. Well, anybody would say that. But are you ready? you sick of sin. you sick of pain and torment because you can't have one without the other. The wages of sin is death. You can't have one without the other. Oh, I like this to have the sin without the pain. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Jesus Christ came to save sinners from their sin. People, gonna, people need to want to be delivered from sin and iniquity. And then, oh, you got yourself a salvation right here. For God has granted to everyone the ability to repent. 
to be turned from it, to be changed, to be no longer under the dominion and power of it, to no longer be subject to the law of sin and death, but now to live under the law of the spirit of life. Wow! To live under the law of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. To live under the spiritual laws dictated to us by God. Here's the way it works. So I want you to pray with me this prayer that goes on in my life. And I would pray that you would make it a part of your life. I pray that you would follow us as we follow Jesus. Because it's really simple. We ask him and he does it. We ask him and believe that he's at work. And we find and discover that he really truly is. And we just simply say, Lord, strengthen my body against sickness and disease. Say it. Say, Lord, strengthen my body against sickness and disease. And then, and, and then you've discovered, my goodness, he will actually do that. You start doing that every day, and finally you discover, wait a minute, I haven't, how long has it been since I've been sick? And that whole bottle of whatever it was you was used and hadn't even been used. You know what I'm saying? The Advil or the whatever, ibuprofen or whatever it is that you need. And then you simply say, Lord, strengthen my spirit to be able to stand against sin and iniquity. How many of you would just really love to have the ability to live in divine health? Never sick again. That, and everybody should be that way. Now, in all honesty, how many of you would love to live in the divine purity to never have sin again? Same source brings both. Same participated will. Your willingness to cooperate results in both. And then we say, Lord, strengthen my soul. So that I only love you. That I only have holy emotions. The, the only pleasures that I want are those at your right hand. Now, I hope this doesn't come hard to you. Well, what was he said? What was it that he was saying? Something about the body. I can't remember what it was. I don't believe that anybody in here is going to have a problem remembering what, what they were supposed to pray about concerning the body. You may have a problem with the spirit and the soul. What was it he said about the spirit? Strengthening the spirit against something. <laughs> to stand against something. And then the soul just evades me. What on earth is he talking about now? About the soul loving. Ooh, rabba stike ne miki itai. And the soul desiring pleasure. In <laughs> Gala Sequoia. And it all being in God. Something like that. So you can go with whatever words you want. But then grab a hold of these words. Lead me not into temptation, Lord. But deliver me from evil. Because you're in charge. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the, power. Yours is the glory. Yours is the Forever. 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 And ever. Forever. And that includes now. That includes now. Mm -hmm. No, this is, I'm just telling you, I'm just trying to be as transparent as I can be this morning. This is how we live our lives. These are the things we say. He's put his words in our mouth. He gave us the word of faith. We don't have to be creative and come up with some unique word of faith concept. He gave us the word of faith. He put it in, his, put it in our mouth. Talk about spoon feeding. Okay, he gave us the word of faith. He said, speak these words to me and here's what will happen. Yes. Ooh, rabab. Take up these words. Keep them. Keep them. Oh, keep them. Father's saying, keep them. Yes. I've just been captivated for a couple of weeks about, you know, sometimes we just, we'll read verses of Scripture we've read so many times, and then all of a sudden we just be captivated, captivated by them. And I, you know, was reading the woman's praise as she begins to worship Jesus with a very unique song. 
Blessed are the paps that gave you nourishment. What a song for us to sing. What an act of worship. Jesus says, no, no. No. Blessed is he who hears my word and keeps it. To hear his word. To say, that's, that, that's what I was, that was the instruction I was looking for. Those were the answers I've been seeking. That's the information I've sought after. Say, I've heard it. It's not, oh, no, man. Now, oh, are you kidding me? You telling me we got a yet another thing we got to do on the list? Give me a break. When does this end? <laughs> God, the Holy Ghost has come to teach us an entirely different way of living. It's everything in this world he has completely and totally condemned. His wrath abides upon it. He'll burn it up with a fervent heat. He'll train you to feel the same way about it as he does. Huh? People want to just revel in the thinking of that they understand the love and the goodness and the mercy of God. When, an, when they don't recognize his wrath that abides upon all sin and ungodliness. Haven't even begun to deal with the reality of his love and his goodness and his mercy. It is love and his goodness and his mercy that has led us to repentance. It's his love and his goodness and mercy that has caused us to hate it too and recognize the demonic power that it is. You know, the Lord spoke to me the other night. He said, men do not realize that demons and Satan hunt the souls of men. We were out hunting. We were in the woods. We are hunting. They hunt. Demons hunt. The souls of men with sin and iniquity. That is the snare. I got a guy who wants to come and run trap lines for, for mountain lions. And set them a certain way. And he wants to run traps, trap lines for, for uh, bobcat. And sets them in a certain way. Satan hunts the souls of the men to snare them. That he may destroy them. That he may block them out of any relationship with God. For there is no God like God and there is no power like his power. And Satan has no ability to stand against the power of the living God. So he turns in every way in his wrath, his rage, his confusion, his hate, his anger. To destroy everything that is God and about God if he can. That's what the battle of Armageddon is all about. Satan trying to destroy everything that looks like God, acts like God, is God. Satan hunts the souls of men who sit in iniquity to destroy them. I pray God's people would just begin to fellowship with the Holy Ghost so that they can have wisdom and understanding. Where it doesn't come hard, it comes easy for everyone who seeks it. Seeks it more than their own thing, things in this life. Seeks it more than rubies and gold. Seeks it more than riches, in other words, or the... Or the lust of the eye, in other words. Huh? Seeks it more than the pleasures of this world, the pleasures of this life. The lust of the flesh. The most subtle of all that I watch as people continually get snared by it. The pride of life. I want to say this one more thing and we're going to just worship the Lord a little bit. i just say this. Do you read my daily bread and he should be loose for a little season? Do you read it? He should be loosed for a little season. I'm not going to share that right now. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But I want you to read that. I want you to consider it because when I get these things, when I write these things, I get downloads from heaven. The Lord's telling me, this is what's going on. I'll allow these things to go on. I said, Lord, why do you allow these places to be set up where people can, who, who are being taught your way, they're being taught your way, they've been reproved and rebuked. Here's you're being taught his way. You can't do that. You can't have that fruit in your life. You can't have those desires going on. You can't yield to that stuff. You can't think that way. You can't behave that way. We're out of here. Because the prince of power there is saying God is legalistic. God is religious. Huh? God is uncaring and condemning. 
Yeah, and so are his messengers. To go and run now to a place where everybody will pat them on the back and say, you're good. Grace, grace. Peace, peace. You're good. You're good. Just stay right here with us. And all oh, those are old bad guys over there. Just, I don't know. They just must be emotionally tweaked or something. Huh? <laughs> Whatever they, is, they want to say. Oh, their damnation is certain. Sealed. Sad. To cast a stumbling block before anyone. To, to turn someone away from the way of righteousness. And, I, and so they, people are clock, flocking to places where there won't, that, that their ways and, of life and living and thoughts and thinking are confirmed. You're okay. It's all right. God accepts you. You're good. So, Lord, why do you allow it? Why? And that's when the Lord said, and Satan should be loose for a little, and he should be loose for a little season. Because the Lord uses it to separate out people who do not really want to know God and walk with him. He searches the heart. Lord, how is it that now men, mankind have been living under your kingdom and reign for a thousand years? Men are looking for an excuse to, to sin. They're lo looking for an excuse to do that which is wrong. A right to be able to participate in evil. So the Lord will lose Satan for a little season. After being under the reign of a thousand years of Christ, men with the angels of the Lord, the angels of the Lord with men, the resurrected saints there, the glorious city of God. And as soon as Satan is loosed, and there's a place for men to run to, to work iniquity, they will run there. And that is how Papa separates wheat from chaff, goat from sheep, light from darkness, truth from light. I said, but, but Father, it's just. It's just. All his judgments are true. Father's not going to confine anybody into the place of his life and his goodness and the way he lives. You've got to want to be there. And if there's anything I pray that you grab a hold of and begin to pray as Lord strengthen, even more than strengthen my body against sickness and disease, oh Lord strengthen my spirit against sin and iniquity, Lord strengthen my soul to love only you, to have a love only for you, to have only holy emotions, to desire only those pleasures that are at your right hand. To look to Papa and say, Lord, deliver me from evil. To have that passion. Not a religious thing that you speak, but to have that passion. Oh, God, keep me from the way of the wicked one. Keep me from the snares of the enemy of my soul. Protect me from those who hunt, my, hunt me to destroy me. David wasn't really talking about the Philistines. I don't believe it. I don't believe David was talking about the Amalekites. I believe he was talking about the spiritual wickedness. It was all about him. And of course, we can see over and again where the Psalms are the love letters of the Father to Jesus while he was on this earth. Is that amazing? That he laid aside all of his glory and became an infant and a baby and had to learn as though his whole memory was erased. Now to be established and to learn, to come to know and understand at a point in his life. More clearly, I must be about my father's business. By 12 years old, I must be about, he showed us the way of the kingdom, how we're to live. He showed us the first indication of the spiritual maturity is a revelation. I must be about my father's business. Ah, it's the perineia, which included submission to the parents. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Come on, isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. Committed is just is a commitment to do what was right. Yeah. Huh? Not run off. He could have taught the greatest teachers of the earth that, yeah. that day. If I said, go home, be with mom and daddy. Yes, sir. We sought everywhere for you, son. Why did you seek everywhere? 
You should have known where to find me. You know, and I think this is so beautiful for people to grasp. What does it mean to be about the Father's business? He was in church. He was in church. Can't take it out of that context. That's where he was. He was in church. Worshiping, talking about all the wondrous things that God has done. Hallelujah. Mambrosataya. Isharapakai. I got to do is begin to talk about these things. All I got to do is begin to talk about them. All I got to do is begin to put these words in your mouth. Don't let them depart out of your mouth. But meditate on them the day and night. And you'll have them. They'll be yours. <laughs> you'll observe them. You'll do them. Father gave us the words to say, the greatest insight and wisdom to know all we've got to do is take it up in a very real and practical way and recognize these are the words of life. They that do them shall deliver their soul from the snare. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, okay, well, what does it mean? Deliver me from evil because you're in charge. Oh, God, I don't want any of it. I don't want any of it deliver me from it what does he do in a practical reality he strengthens our spirit with insight to resist all sin and iniquity to see its end before it begins to see its conclusion before it starts <laughs> hallelujah to see its eternal destruction before one moment is given to it ah to strengthen our soul to strengthen our soul to love only the pleasures that are at his right hand hallelujah 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 I'm going to say one more thing before we sing. One more thing in the announcements. Because I just, you know, I just want to share with you the things that the Lord's been talking to me about. I want to, I want to share, you know, the, the things that are so real to me. Because he gives them to me, not for me, but also for those people. That he's caused me to watch over their soul. And it's just so important for me, you know, just to say these things. And, you know, lest I forget, lest you forget, just continually put, just to be built up in, in remembrance of these things in the Spirit. God has put a glorious call upon every person's life. Some you can see, some you can't. By default, I know what God has done because I can read in His Word for everyone. Huh? I begin to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to, I want, I want to grow and mature in love so that I love people instantly. It doesn't take five minutes a day or two weeks or whatever. I want to love people instantly and then can be committed to that love. But here's what happens. Even though and you, there are, everybody has been given a call upon their life of greatness, of greatness, few step into it because few are willing to live the consecrated life. What do you mean by consecrated life? The willingness to just live in a love relationship with the Lord in a very practical and real way. And the Lord, the Lord, you know, talked to me, began to talk to me this way, and I said, Father, show me in the areas where I've not been consecrated, where, where I've not heard, where I've not been willing to listen. Things that I'm blinded to, things that I would justify. Because, you know, where I'm at spiritually and when the things, the insight the Lord gives me, I look at people doing things that you think, how on earth? I mean, if I did that, I would not even, I would not be able to lift my head. I, I, I wouldn't be able to lift my head towards the Lord. How on earth can people do these, those things? But deception can work. And Lord, I don't want any deception. Holy Spirit, you're the spirit of truth. I want you to know right now. I submit my whole self to you. I want you to tell me just like it is. I want you to speak to me plainly. I'm going to be like a back. I'm going to go up and pull my high place to see what the Lord says when he reproves me. Well, a lot of folks can't even begin to understand that. And nobody went to his house to get reproved. Uh-huh. Nobody went to his house to get rebuked. I, I, I did that I might be taught and instructed in his ways and established in hating everything that was wrong. I don't want nobody confirming my way. I want to be established in his way. Huh? I, you don't want anybody confirming your lifestyle. You want that thing to be damned. Huh? That you might be established in the way of God. You want to hate it and have more 
indignation against it than any uh, hell fire and brimstone preacher that ever preached. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hey, come on now. Amen. This is true. Yes. This, we, we cried out to God, our Savior, to be delivered from evil, to be delivered from the death trap of sin and iniquity, to be delivered from ungodliness and the ways that were set against us to destroy our soul forever. These are the people of the Lord. Somebody said, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a culture of condemnation. I hear the lying spirit of hell. And then do with culture of condemnation. It's a culture to absolutely reject everything of this world and say no to it and say it's wrong. There's one thing this world cannot stand, and everybody has a spirit of this world, is to say, you are wrong. And you must change. You cannot be like that. You can't act like that. You must do this. The world doesn't want to hear that. And the spirit of the world has invaded the church. I heard Billy Graham last night. I was listening to Billy Graham and I heard him say. By and large, I'm going to just paraphrase what he said. But he said this. He was recognizing that most people that sit in the church do not know Jesus. They do not have the saving knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ. They have a great void and emptiness on the inside and they try to fill it with everything that is in this world that they can get, whether it's a job or whether it's... He went through the list. So true. From Billy Graham all the way through, I can see the great company of God's men that he's raised up saying, people... It's time to repent and get right with God. For your life is about over. And there is a certain judgment. One of the foundations of truth, of the established truth, is repentance towards God. Repentance, faith towards God. And judgments. The judgment. Judgment. I won't be judged right now. I won't be judged right now. I'm, that I'm not going to be condemned with the world. Huh? God made me a judge in the house. As much as he made room for judges to sit upon the judgment seats of the legal system to tell people where they're wrong and where they're right. So he made me a judge in his house. So thus he said, rebuke, reprove. Judge not that you be not judged. I will be judged. I already accept that. Huh? And I will judge with his judgments. God has already judged. I'm here declaring his judgments. If I didn't, I would be a deceiver. Are you listening? Yes. Here's God's judgments. I don't care what we I don't care what this perverse an evil generation is saying. God said, what did God say to do with a perverse and evil generation? What did he say? What did he say about how to deal and interface with a perverse and, and wicked generation? What did he say to do? Rebuke it. Reprove it. Oh, live and let live. No, sir, there's no life there. Uh -huh. It's dead and let them continue to be dead. No. Father has got people, champions that he's raised up to execute his will and declare his word. And I'm going to minister on that in a few minutes if I have time. Really, I'm going to minister. Those that be of you shall restore the, the breach, be repair the breach, restore the path to dwell in. Isaiah 58, 12. I'm going to minister on the covenant relationship that God has with those who are willing to stand with him. Our right, our purpose, what we are supposed to be doing with our life, so that you get real focused on what your occupation is. Because some of you are confused. Okay? Let's quit being bivocational. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Harabasai. Harabakane. Mandaleo tu. Ebre mandeste yete. Kandalopa koshipini. Jesus. Well, let's just all stand together and sing a worship song here.
Mandeng dalna manga de sepanang and takasina katahiki and katana. Hallelujah. Mamanda dada sepetiki sepanayata. Amanesiki and namotusi eki and akea tia kadanate atea. Lucy penaniata. Mananga dea masatea tu. Can you, can you, do you, do you, are you, are you, are you have a song that you're getting ready to sing? Does it have a whole lot of Jesus in it? I'd, I'd, like, I'd just like to sing about Jesus for a little bit. I mean, that's all good because it's the Word of God. Singing the Word of God is good. I just want to sing Jesus. Can, can you, you are my God, and you are my King. And you are the faithful one. You are my God. And you are my King. And you are the faithful one. Mm, hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. Lord Jesus, you're my God. Lord Jesus, you're my King. My God, my King, I worship you. Lord Jesus, you're my God. Lord Jesus, you're my King, my God, my King, I worship you, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you're my God, Lord Jesus, you're my King, my God, my King, I worship you, hallelujah. Go ahead, sing a song about Jesus. Anybody, just go ahead and just, any song has got a lot of Jesus in it, just go ahead and sing it. And Oh, I 
you to repeat this a name above all names the Lord Jesus I want you to repeat after me name above all names the name of Jesus above all names the name of Jesus Above all names, the name of Jesus. Name above all names, the name of Jesus. The name above every name that is named. The name above all, every name that is named. The name that is above every name that is named. The name that is above every name that is named. The name that is above every name. The name that is above every name that is named. The name that is above every name that is named. In the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The authority of the name of Jesus now. The authority that is the name of Jesus. 
the authority of the name of Jesus now the authority of the name of Jesus now Amen. Dear people, I, I want you to, to just, you can be seated. I want you to just be committed with me. We're in a time of, right now that Father is looking for those who will stand up and be counted with Him and numbered with Him. We, we are commissioned to go everywhere and declare those things which Jesus Christ claimed. We are to go everywhere and announce in His name those things which God the Father has spoken. And I want, you to let, I want you to get the name of Jesus so plastered all over your life that when somebody sees you come in, they say, there comes one of those Jesus people. Because they're just always talking about Jesus. This is the name that is given above every other name. All power and authority is given in this name. Father has given us a commission to cast out devils, to deliver people, in other words, from the torment of sin and the deception of Satan by the name, in the name of Jesus. There is no other name whereby men can be saved but by the name of Jesus. Loving, clinging, cleaving to that name is the most important thing that you can be doing with your life because there's going to most certainly come a moment in time where that name is going to make all the difference of where you're going to spend eternity. And that name makes the difference of how you live and where you spend the now. Not just the eternity, whether you spend the now in the blessings of God and the goodness of God, living in the, in, in, the, in the things of heaven upon this earth, or being caught up in the same cares of this life and in the same ploy, a ploy of Satan that he executes upon the wicked and the unrighteous ultimately being effective in your life as well. So I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you begin to plaster the name of Jesus all over everything that you're doing Amen. and that everything that you're about will be about declaring this wonderful authority of the King of Kings, announcing to all men everywhere that the kingdom of God and of His Christ is here. Hallelujah. That Christ Jesus now reigns in heaven and he's soon to reign upon this earth. He's now ex executing his will and everybody who is willing to be saved and calls upon the name of the Lord is allowed to come in. He, stand at the, he stands at the door of every man's heart knocking. He's given an open invitation for all men to come. The door is open and the time is short and people need to quickly respond. You don't have to have any more of just a, a, a declaration of that, and you're going to see people come into the kingdom of God. You, listen, I'm telling you, the anointing of God is upon His Word, and anybody who's going to speak His Word, and Father's looking for some champions right now. God has always had covenant partners. He's always had somebody that He executed His judgment, His will. He worked with them and through them. Ultimately, we see that manifested in the full expression of what He did through the life and ministry of Jesus. Where Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree as he stood there making intercession for us. But I want to help you to understand that right now we make a difference of what goes on in this world. We make a difference of what goes on in the midst of the church. We make a difference of whether or not Father's got someone to continue the program on with. Enoch was an example of that. Noel was an example of that. Uh, Abraham was an example of that. Job was an example of that. God's got one person. He's got one champion. He's dealing with men through the actions of one man. Daniel was, a, Daniel was a great example of that. A man who rises up to pray because it looks like that the captivity will continue. It looks like the word of the Lord somehow has been delayed and somebody's willing to believe God and stand up and take God for his word for what it is he said he would do and lay claim to the authority to begin to move the people of God forward in that. And because, because Daniel was not willing to let things go on as they seem to be going on. He, didn't, he was not willing to allow circumstances to, uh, to as it were, re keep them in a place of captivity, but to pray them through to the plan and purposes of God. Father went ahead and revealed his entire, the entirety of his plan uh, to Daniel, not just, not just what he was going to do with them at that moment in time and how they would be delivered and how they would go back to Israel. 
but he unfolded to them everything that would take place to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the eternal kingdom of God. Amazing what God would do when he's got somebody who would champion his cause. When you and I let sin in our life, ultimately we give it permission to run through everybody else's life because the church, who we are, God calls us the hinderer of iniquity or the, the hinderer of lawlessness. And because we stand against sin and iniquity, because we take a stand as God's ambassadors, as his representatives on the earth, it has to stop. But when we abdicate and we don't stand, it runs right over top of the entirety of the church. And if it runs over top of the entirety of the church, it runs over top of the world. We're the salt of the earth. And if the salt no longer exists, if the salt has lost its savor, it's, there's no means of preservation. We're the light. And if the light quits shining, it's just darkness. God's looking for some people to stand with him. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just saying this in context to a few verses of Scripture that I want to give you real quickly. And uh, I want you to understand how, how so, I'm going to start off this very intense subject of how God empowers us to represent Him. Got one man standing on the earth, ultimately declaring God's will and, and pursuing Father's purposes, and through Him, ultimately, Humanity then is preserved. Humanity is, receives the declaration of God's will. Uh, humanity is given hope, given confidence, given expectation, ultimately given faith. And let's talk real quickly about a, a king named Azza who started off really well, doing well. But, and his heart was perfect towards the Lord in the beginning. In other words, he completely put his trust in God. But something happened to his upright, his perfect heart. Somebody said, what do you mean perfect heart? I mean a heart that's steadfast on knowing God is who he says he is. And he's going to do what he said he would do. And all I've got to do is stand and rely and trust upon him. Cursed is the man who puts his, his trust in the arm of flesh. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I can be confident that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Now, now, Azza had reason to trust God. God had blessed him. God had intervened for him. God had established him. And now all of a sudden, now that he's got more, he's got more to lose. Now he's got more to trust God with. A lot of people, when they've got a little to trust with God with, it's, fairly, it's not a problem. But as soon as they've got a little bit more to trust with God with, or they've got a lot to trust God with, now they become a little bit insecure about losing it all. Are we sure we can still trust God? So Father, now having established Azza in the 36th year of his reign, ultimately is going to be tested with all the blessings and the goodness that God has given him. And what he's going to do is he's going to fail the test. And ben is making trouble, and he figures the best thing for him to do, the wisest and, 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 and quickest plan for any king to move on is to form alliances and get some help from other people around him because in this particular situation, God's not big enough to trust. Now, of course, nobody articulates it that way, but that's how God takes it. Okay, and he says something very strong for you and me, and I want us to hear it because God's talking to you. He wants to make a champion out of you. There's going to be or the, the, the fundamental thing that you're going to have to be willing to do is trust God and let your heart be perfect towards him. And, and it doesn't matter what goes on in your life. You trust him. You cry out to him. You learn to depend upon him in every dimension of your life for everything that you need. And then ultimately what you're going to find is the greatness of God. The, in other words, the ways of God, the presence of God manifested through your life. So here in First Chron Second Chronicles, rather, Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. We read this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole of the earth. Father is searching, in other words. The psalmist said, his eyes behold, his eyelids try. God sits in his holy temple. The psalmist said, God sits in his holy temple in Psalms 11, 4. He said, God sits in his holy temple. He sits upon his throne. His eyes behold, his eyelids try. You know, when, when, when God is encouraging um, Zerubbabel by his prophet Zechariah, even also in Zechariah chapter 4, I believe it is in 4 verse 10, he, he, he says to him, he says, listen, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole of the earth. These, these, these eyes, these seven spirits of the Lord, the Father's ability to perceive, Father's ability his, to, to communicate, his presence is is continually, as it were, searching over the vast expanse of humanity looking for somebody who's going to believe them, 
who's going to absolutely trust him and he has the right to keep elevating the, the activity of that, of, of that trust to elevate the activity of that relationship we see with Abraham. God's got a man now that he can bring the Christ, the Messiah, through humanity. Through him, God now picks a man, finds a man that he can bring forth the Redeemer through his descendants, through his very loins, through his very life, through the very activity of how he behaves himself, how he interacts with God results in whether or not there is going to be a family through which the Messiah can be born. I mean, you can't talk about more radical covenant relationship and responsibility in the plan of God for man to step up and participate. Men want to live their own life, do it their own way and then tell God he needs to do something on his own behalf if he wants to get anything done around here. Now we have to change. Now, now that you've heard it today, you have to change. You're going to have to recognize, no, that's not the way it goes down. Jesus said, I'm going to give you power to represent heaven. I'm going to give you power to represent the kingdom. I'm going to give you power to represent me and the will of the Father. Well, then who's willing to do that? Who's willing to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire? Who's willing to live that kind of separated life? I am. And everybody should say within, I am. I am. Everybody should get that earnestness. Get that, get that, get that uh, eye of the tiger. Get that passion. Get that, get that, as it were, boxer training. And you're sitting, you know, getting ready to enter the ring. And you're like, you stand up and you're like, well, I'm going to punch you before we get started. <laughs> Come on now, get with the program now. Because I'm talking to people who stirred with holy passions. I'm talking to people who are stirred with righteous causes. I mean, you think about what God did when he began to find somebody who understood, wait a minute, David is supposed to be king, and they were stirred in their heart to see the kingdom of David established. What did God do with them? His scripture says that he made them mighty men. People who are not stirred are not going to be mighty. They're going to be average, normal. They're going to live a mediocre life in the kingdom of God at best. Who's going to be stirred? Who will be stirred with this righteous cause? Because I'm going to tell you, one of the first things you need to believe is that his eyes are examining humanity, searches everywhere looking for me, looking for you, saying, will you stand? Where will you stop trusting me? After that you said, I will stand. Then where do you stop trusting me? It all began because a man that God gave responsibility to, to represent all of humanity, to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge, to be the one who would be the, the, the leader and the one responsible for how men would live upon the earth. He refused to trust Father. His name was Adam refused to trust Father. The, the, the trust didn't ever get elevated to the point that it got elevated with a Abraham. I mean, it would be big enough. It's big enough for God to tell you, leave everything today. Now you're going to the mission field. You're taking nothing with you. I'm going to show you a place that I'm going to use you in a great way. And I'm going to bless humanity through you. Abraham not knowing even where he was going. Where am I going? Don't worry about it. Get on the boat. Don't worry about it. Head out that way. Huh? Well, Lord, I don't have a, my, my car's broken down. Lord, the camel's sick. Whatever. All, I'm sure there was a lot of things. Lord, they're going to give me a raise next week. Oh, gone. You know, this is situation here with the family. The wife is really kind of aggravated with me right now. And this is going to set her off. It could end our relationship forever. This could be the end of our marriage. Whatever. Everybody deals with We think, well, you know, we try to make it sterile. And we try to make it, uh, as it were, apart from the circumstances that you and I deal with every day. The things that hold us back from doing, doing it God's way. Now, let me just tell you something. When I start preaching like this, when I start begin to deal with this, everything begins to be manifested in terms of our will and the state of our, of our heart. And I've never dealt good with the discerning of spirits. I've never dealt good with the exposure of the will of men. 
I want you to just say here today, I want you to not make excuses for yourself. I don't want you to draw back. I don't want you to say, well, I tried that. It didn't work. I want you to say every point along the way, I want you to say yes, Lord, so we can keep the atmosphere rich. I want you to say, I'm going to do it right this next time, Papa. I promise you. Don't sit back there and start thinking about regretting. God don't like me and he don't like me. And he's talking bad about me again. I came to the meeting. Why can't we go back when he's talking softly like before we started singing? Because right now we're letting the light shine a little bit brighter on you. Huh? Before we were just teaching you how to talk to Father to help you. Now we're shining the bright on your the light brightly upon your will. And I pray that no one misses out on this great opportunity and blessing. I mean, Father's looking everywhere and he's not picky. Father has placed you in a position where you're at right now, and he's looking for responses out of you where you're at right now. And if your responses are right now, they won't be right later. And just because your responses are right now doesn't mean they're going to be right later. You're going to have to build this thing up in the realms of the holy faith. You're going to have to build this stuff up in the realms of relationship with God. I mean, Father wants your eyes to be open so that you might see the exceeding greatness of His power that has been given to you to execute His greatness in the earth. Exceeding greatness of His power that was given to us when He raised Jesus at the earth. Going to death, set him at his own right hand. A power, the authority of heaven to without any limitation execute God's will. We're going to draw back where we're afraid. We're going to draw back. Fear is one of the biggest things to stop people. We're going to, we're going to bri- draw back. I mean, people live in hurt. I mean, you might as well just, if you're going to live in hurt, you might as well just go ahead and dig yourself a hole, lay in the hole and pull the dirt in on top of you. Because I'm telling you right, you're telling you right now, you decided your 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 life's not going to count no more. Because hurt, disappointment, discouragement, ultimately bitterness leads you to a place of complete imprisonment. I mean, people are going to have to learn how to forgive and let go of things. People are going to have to learn that there's a bigger picture picture for you than your own self interest. Father's looking for somebody. Papa's looking, his eyes searching, his eyelids trying. Abraham now. One thing after the next, after the next, it kept getting ratcheted up. Just go ahead and read about Abraham's life. Read about Jesus' life. It keeps getting ratcheted up. If Jesus would have been looking for the applauses of men, he would have stopped far short of everything he did. Far short of everything he did. <laughs> so many people draw back because they're afraid. If they say it like God said it, you know, all they're going to get is rejection and they can't handle it. We're talking, of, we're talking of people who are willing to be valiant for God, who are interested in seeing Jesus Christ established as the king of this earth. Not David, Jesus. Amen. Who has stirred up recognizing, wait a minute, he's king. And his kingdom should be established. And I'm going to give my life, I'm going to lay my all upon the altar to see that happen. Those are the people that God made mighty. Those are the people that God made might, will make mighty today. Are you listening to me? I pray that you are. Ultimately, we see Abraham take Isaac. My goodness, what an intense test. Oh, what, what an intense, what, what a description of this, that Abraham truly was living in heaven and not in earth. He had no problem having Isaac make the transition from the earth to the heaven because he knew there's no death with God. God, God, in his love, has planned out, he designed life for everybody to live forever. And then that wonderful, that no one dies. Jesus is, the, Jesus is the life, and he's the resurrection from the dead. Amen. And it's just wonderful. And, uh, but at any rate, they, those are really, I think those are the things that God, by and large, if you want to say, what is the test really about? The test is really about whether you're living in heaven or living in earth. Whether you're pursuing the will of the Father or pursuing your own will. And that is a transition that can only take place in the reality of a true relationship with the Lord. Where he's now able to take you and me and show us. I mean, praise God, Abraham got to go up into the, that place with God and that mountain with God. And, and he got to look over the expanse of, of the geography that was before him and also of time. And God showed him, look, what, look at what your inheritance looks like. He showed him the world that is to come. And that's why we read in Romans chapter 4. That he was made the heir of the world to come. He got to see the expanse of all that God was giving him. Father's eyes had searched to and fro. His eyes ran. His presence, his evaluation, his looking, his seeking after someone who will stand with him. He's got one man. Job, I got one man. Man, how many of you are desperate about being that one man? 
Oh, come on, man. That's all the Father wants. That's the starting point. People that don't want to raise their hand, that are looking down at the ground, they don't even have a starting point yet. They don't even have a place to begin yet. They don't even have a place to hope yet. They don't even have a place to expect yet. Man, when we want, I mean, because the, 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 the end analysis is this. We become, and we are God-made men, not self-made men. Uh, God isn't looking for great talents. He ain't looking for great abilities. He's not looking for great skills. He's looking for somebody who has a discernment and understanding of what it's supposed to be or what it's supposed to look like and saying, look, I might not have the skills or might not, might, I might not have the talents, but here I go. I wouldn't doubt, I wouldn't doubt that Samson was four foot nine inches. I wouldn't doubt that he was four foot nine inches and he had wee little arms. <laughs> because Father likes to take weak things and do mighty stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's true. Uh, he had to have supernatural strength to jump up and pop somebody in the head. Otherwise, he was just contending with the knees. No, it's true. People look at your, we look at ourselves. We look at our own skill set. We look at our own ability. We look at our limitations. Well, we evaluate how much money with God speaks and we look at our wallet. He's not in the wallet. He's in heaven. He reigns over all things. His hands have established it. God, He's created it. There is no God I know of none, said the psalmist, with the power that you alone have, O oh God. And Father says, I'm looking for someone to execute my will. I'm looking for someone I can show my power through them. Azza has all the reason to, be, to, to trust God. It's not like he didn't have an opportunity to have his faith built. It wasn't a, as though he didn't have an opportunity to hear the word of the Lord. He did. And here comes the prophet, Hananiah. Can't you see him? And the prophets always came out when it was bad, bad news. Bad news. Guess what? God wants to speak to you on the basis of a personal relationship. But if you stiffen your neck and you harden your heart and you cause your ears to where that they will not hear, you cause another, you're, you cause your ears so they do not hear. And he sends somebody else out to tell you what's going on. So you can hear it loud and clear. And this is what happens to Azza. And, you know, if I would have heard this, I pray, if I would have heard this, that I would have fallen down on my face and I would have repented. But wait a minute, we've already spent the money. We can't get it back. It was a no return policy. I mean, it was like you give the money and it's it. It's over. And besides that, now, we, now we'll not only ha not have an ally to help us we won't even have any money to help pay them off if we should get ourselves in a pinch all the same reasons of why we don't fall on our face when god speaks and asks for a complete turnaround and complete surrender was going on in oz's heart as well but there was a greater cost to him and so he didn't repent three years later he dies of a sickness the eyes of the lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth he wants to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. God, our Heavenly Father, establishes over and over again what he means by a perfect heart towards him. A perfect heart towards him says, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what. I'm going to run to you if I fail and trust you no matter what. If I, if I, if I stumble, if I sin, I'm going to run to you and I'm going to repent and I'm going to lay hold on you and I'm going to cry out to you. If I get sick, I'm going to run to you. If I, if I find myself in trouble, I'm going to run to you. I'm going to believe you. I'm gonna, I have all my confidence and all my hope and all my trust and everything that I have in, in terms of what I want to be and what the future holds for me. It's in you. It's a perfect heart. I have a perfect heart towards the Father. I've kept a perfect heart towards the Father. He's established me in a perfect heart. People wonder, you know, devil comes along and tries to strip that from everybody. Oh, you can't know oh, anybody who talks about a perfect heart. All they are is a fanatic dreamer. They want to bully us. To try to strip from us our confidence in God. And then the Papa's established us, give us a perfect heart. So that we can learn to trust him. Had there been times that I could have trusted him more. I'm certain of it. But I'm going to tell you right now. Every time. Every turn in the road. I've set my heart. To say, Lord, whether I live or whether I die, I'm putting my trust in you, God. Father, you my only desire. you my only one. This, you, my, you're, you're all that I desire in this life. Yes. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'm just, and I'm saying these things to you because I want you to take these same words and responses 
in your own mouth because this is the response of those, of those whom God used in the earth that is described in his holy word and is described also in the history books of the church. Father, I will not back up. I won't let up. I won't stop for nothing I'm until I see your kingdom established in the earth because I come to understand you're supposed to be king and no one else. And of course, the prophet said, Here and you did foolishly. Therefore, from now on, war will not depart from you. And that's exactly what happened. He was trying to ensure that he could be successful, retain the authority of his kingdom, and all he did was lose it because he was unwilling to trust Father. Just, I mean, when Papa's got our life, I mean, once again, you know, the bravest people on the battlefield are those who already resigned themselves to die. I'm not coming home. I'm here for one purpose. That's to do, this, to do this work on the battlefield. When we just surrender our life to Jesus, when we surrender, surrender our life to do the will of the Father, huh, then nothing else matters. And there's no problem to say to forsake houses and to forsake family and father and mother and brother and sister and wife or husband also. I'm not going to get, I'm going to let that any earthly relationship stand in the way of me doing what God's purpose for me to do. It's going to have to get in line. That's all there is to it. Obviously, Father wants us to love everybody, especially those of our own household, but it can't get in the way of you obeying God with total abandonment and of somebody you love's running interference and you need to love God more. Uh -huh. Because the Lord Jesus says you're not worthy of me if you can't, if you can't get... There, there has to be a consecration and a commitment here to where that it is absolutely a sold-out situation in your, in your heart, a sold-out purpose in your heart otherwise the enemy is going to get in there he's going to he's going to deceive you through it he's going to lead you in the wrong way you're going to make wrong choices and you're going to miss out you're going to make wrong alliances you're going to trust in the wrong thing really all it comes down to from adam to you i'm going to say this all it comes down to is from adam to you is do you trust god and we can say yeah we trust god but just let some sake let some perilous time come shaking things up huh let all, this is more than just a bill this is a, come on, this is a neighboring nation going to come and destroy your whole nation and you. You know, but all of a sudden, be his heart become full of pride. Whose nation is this anyways, he should have said. This is not my nation, it's God's nation. It isn't mine to protect, it's his to protect. It's not mine to keep, it's his to keep. Everything got confused in his mind. It happens in people's minds. Your mind will play tricks on you. Huh? God blesses you, and all of a sudden, it's yours. And you got it by your own strength and by your own armor. And by your own ability. Oh, watch out now. You're not living in heaven anymore. You're living in earth. Now the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, will spoil, spoil you. His word won't be able to produce its fruit. God's trying you right now. See how much you trust him. God's trying you right now to see how much you're willing to live for him. If you ever, just every time, listen, I'm going to tell you the best answer to give God. Every time. Yes. Yes, Lord. That, that, I mean, one of the songs we used to sing a lot is a real simple song. It's easy to learn. I'll say yes. You don't need an overhead for this one. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes, yes, yes. That's it. Just live your life this way. Turning every, turning every part of your heart towards him. Every part of your desire turn towards him listen to this is look at now listen to this i want you to listen to these verses of scripture very carefully i want you to listen to isaiah 59 16 and he saw the lord saw that there was no man and he wondered he was amazed he was literally bewildered here i got this nation of people here I got this nation of people. <laughs> At least Isaiah was saying, I'm willing to go for you. He's got one guy who's willing to, the Lord's standing there. He, his, Isaiah's eyes are open. He sees God says, sitting in his temple, sitting in that place that the psalmist said in Psalms 11, 6. He sits in his, 11, 1 rather, sits in his holy temple. His eyes try, his eyes behold. He sees Father sitting there. And he, says, he said, Father says, who will go for me? As Isaiah said, I'll go. But here, he, here the Lord's looking for someone who will stand for the right, 
someone who will stand up and say, we want God's ways and His kingdom established to this earth. We want Him to be Lord of lords and King of kings. We want those things that are concerning His will, concerning His plan to be established here. We don't want the enemy. We don't want the powers of darkness. We don't want the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. We don't want the things that the world demands us to submit to. He's bewildered because there's no one. I can't even imagine that. He's bewildered. There's no one. There's no intercessor. There's no one who would take a stand and smack the thing. Because literally this word means to smack or to strike at it. Strike at what? Smack at what? The wrongdoing. Those things that opposes the will of the Father. I mean, yeah, we can see, we can see Moses being willing to champion God's will. And, and stands and makes an intercession for all of Israel saying, No, Lord. No, Lord. No. Don't do it. Pardon them. And the only reason he had a right, the only reason he had the ability, was because who he was to God. His willingness to stand faithful to the Lord. His willingness to, with total abandonment, be God's man. Otherwise, he had no, he had no ability to be an intercessor. Oh, there might have been some people. Of course, there would have been plenty of people saying, Oh, God, don't destroy Israel. Oh, we, you people. Oh, God, you're supposed to be blessing us. He would have had any... It, you know, plenty of people in line to do that, but he had nobody that w- had the right to do it. Abraham had the right to do it. When the, when the Lord had turned to go down and look for himself, if Sodom and Gomorrah was as evil as, it, 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 as the reports had described it to be. And as he turned to go, Abraham said, Lord, listen to me. Would you save the place? Because he's thinking of his family. He's, he's crying out for his kinsmen that are there. Won't you spare the place? There's somebody who has the ear of the Lord. It's in this context that the Lord says his eyes are open and she sees and he beholds. They're upon the righteous. His ears open. He's listening to their prayer. There's the intercessor. But the person who does evil... The person has given themselves over to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, who goes after the things that belong to this world and not the things that belong to the will of the Father. He says his face is against them. He's not, he's not in partnership with them. He's not in a covenant relationship with them. They can't hedge the gap. They can't bridge the gap. They can't be an intercessor. They can't stand in a, in a position of seeing Father's will and power and authority and glory executed in the earth. There's ever a time that there needs to be an intercessor that a cry out for this nation, somebody who has an authority in heaven so that the power of God can be released to their lives. It's now. If there's ever a time, if there's ever a, if there's ever a fiery furnace, it's Southern California. Yeah. It's these, it's this soft feathered pillow that we lay our heads upon, lusting for more when we have so much. And everybody's secure in their work job and their bank account and their houses and secure in the, in the things that belong to something that's purely earthly. Hmm. I believe one of the great advancements of the church was because everybody was willing to come sell what they had and lay it at the apostles' feet. In other words, lay it at the feet of, of, of the kingdom of God for the purposes of advancing the kingdom of God. They had it in their heart and their mentality was, he's coming now. This is the time of the return of the Lord. We want you, Lord, to come set up your kingdom. We don't want to hold on to our kingdom. We're not interested in building our own empire. We want your glory to come fill the earth. We hang on because we act like we will live forever and then we will die and things will go on as they are. There's got to be a shift where we are constantly servants attending to our master's business. Servants that are waiting for our Lord to return, not knowing when, what time it is that he should come. When you live like that, it's an entirely different disposition and mentality. It's an entirely different reaction that you would have to circumstance, especially crisis, because crisis describes to us what we really are. Uh-huh. Crisis describes what we made of, who we trust. Uh-huh. And we can point the finger at Israel and wonder how it is that they were so messed up, but people like Oz and wonder how they could have failed to see and realize how could have they been so aloof from reality. 
Yet we have to step, for, step back for a second and look at the choices that we've been making. And the only, re- the only response to that is to repent, cry out to God and say, Father, change me. I want to change in every way. Strengthen me, in other words. And Father says to us, here's what he says in terms of what he has empowered us to do. Yes, Satan goes to and fro throughout the earth looking to whom he may devour. But God goes to and fro, to and fro throughout the earth looking whom he may empower. And I'm telling you, what Father wants to do is far greater than what Satan wants to do. You and I have got to recognize, Father said, I give you my strength. I'll strengthen you. Be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. He just, it's a general call to all. It's no one's left out of this. I, here's, I'll give you everything I got so you can be successful in executing my will in the earth. You've got to be passionate about that. And that's why we have to, we have to be, give ourselves to saying, Father, we recognize it's not by might, it's not by power, but by your spirit. That's the response of, of the prophet in, in, in Zechariah chapter 4. And then the Lord describes the fullness of his spirit, this, his presence, his manifest uh, 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 presence that brings empowerment, that it goes throughout the earth ready to establish anybody who's going to say, I'm not going to trust in my own strength. Oh, we can sing the song, it's not by might, it's not by power, we get all excited, but by your spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, it's not by might, and we can get harmonies going, get a good, you know, drum beat and bass thing going, but how about when all of a sudden, the circumstances, the crisis, and the pressure hits. And everything in you that is human says, run! (laughs) And everything about your (laughs) survival instincts is screaming, help me. And the help is crying out for human help. Doesn't anybody care for me? Doesn't anybody love me? Isn't anybody going to help me? I was dealing with a person this morning who said, I just need to be loved. I said, no, you don't understand. You need to love. The love you want is only found when you begin to love others. And you got a whole world out there that's willing to accept the love. So bring it. Oh, I want you to love me. I ain't going to do anything for you. You're going to have to begin to cooperate with God's way. Look at how what Father did. Look at how Father does. He trains us to love. You know how he trains us to love? We don't know anything about love. He trains us to love. By showing us how to love him, filling us with a love to love him. He says, here, let me give you, let me empower you. We're, we're kids, you know. Right. So I just want to set you up, you know. You're just now getting started and everything. Here, let me give you a trillion, billion, whatever, dollars worth of love. Let me give you an immeasurable amount of riches and wealth and love so just to get you started. Huh? But it's so much more that I, there's no even number to put to it. Huh? Sabakia namosataya. This isn't a story. This isn't a story. This isn't a possibility. This is a living reality. You choosing what your career is going to be. You, you can, everything can change, but I guarantee you the more you delay, the, the, the less likely you'll say yes. Somebody said, oh, oh, but Abraham, but Moses started when he was 80. Yeah, but he didn't get a chance till he was 80. Oh, Wigglesworth started when he was in his 50. Yeah, but he didn't get a chance till he was in his 50. You started hearing these things how long ago? You're listening to me. You hear, you begin to move. It's not about what you can do and what you can be. It ain't about that. It isn't about whether people applaud you or reject you. It ain't even about that. It's about doing what Father said to do. That's all the rewards you need. At the end of it all, you say, we unprofitable servants. We've done that which is required of us. <laughs> I'm not looking for my reward right now. I'm not looking for the praises of men. I'm not looking for whether or not you can evaluate upon your scale, whether or not I'm successful or a failure. It does not matter. All the reward I want is well done, my good and faithful servant. And I'm telling you, the way people act, they act like God's a liar. They think that God's going to say to them, well done, my good And faithful servant. That's three classes right there. Huh? Good, faithful servant. Come on now. 
People, I'm telling you right now, all you and I can do is begin. All we can do is just take the first step. All we can do is say, Father didn't say to Abraham when he appeared to Avram, when he appeared to him in the land of Ur, when he lived among the Chaldeans, saying, I want you to go now and take your son, sacrifice him upon an altar that I'm going to show you. Of course, he didn't have a son, or he didn't even say, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a son, and you can go and sacrifice him on an altar that I'm going to show you. He didn't do it that way. It's one step at a time. I want you to go where I want you. I want you to go where I'm going to lead you. Will you go where I'm going to lead you? you, Father, ask you to take the first step. Will you go where I'm going to lead you? Now, I'll make a, because you're willing to do this, I'll make a mighty nation out of you. I'm going to bless all the people of the earth through you. I'm going to change circumstance. I'm going to change the world and the social system of humanity because you're willing to obey me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Patrick walks into Ireland says, this day I bring down the kingdom of Satan and his hordes of Druids. And in one day, Ireland is saved. By one man, a whole nation has changed. By one man. All the power of that demonic stronghold and that witchcraft that had ruled a nation for, I don't know how long, hundreds of years. One man says, I'm changing it all today. One man walks into Germany Cuts down the tree that they worshipped with one blow of an axe and turns Germany upside down for the kingdom of God. It goes on and on and on. One man who's willing to totally, with complete abandonment, trust God. (laughs) Over and again, we'll see it over and again. One preacher lost in the woods whose life had come to an end, who had been rejected by preachers, who had been rejected by churches, who couldn't be successful as a preacher no matter what he did, stumbles into a town in northern Germany, leads a family to Jesus. And out of that family comes Reinhard Bonnke. Come on now. The way we measure things. Listen, dude, listen. Now, these stories go on and on and on. Somebody who's willing with total abandonment. A man who raises up a church in upstate New York, starts it, builds it. Now he's in his 40s. He's a radical preacher. He's kind of strange. People can't really relate to him. He's always calling everybody to prayer. And it's just kind of he's like stale and stinky and just we need somebody young and full of life because we're kind of feeling like we're in a ditch here. And they say, listen, pastor, we love you and everything, but we need a younger man. Younger man, I'm only 45. Yeah, but you just don't have the goods. You just don't have what we need to take us to that next place. And in the midst of that rejection, he falls upon his face and his name sounds out through the history books and will sound out out through the book of Acts throughout the ages. Father Nash falls upon his face and begins to pray and cry out to God to shake this nation and stands long as a partnership with Charles Finney in my what God did to two people with total abandonment, with total abandonment, they changed the state of the government of this nation. It goes on and on and on. Paul is looking. Well, we got the same, everybody's got to deal with the same fears, same threats, same rejection. Could it just go off in a corner and die? You're feeling sorry for yourself. No, I failed. I say, dig another well. Somebody stops up you well, just dig another one. It doesn't matter how many times they stop it up, dig yourself another one. Hallelujah. And God's going to establish you because you just don't quit. You can't stop somebody who's steeled with this, who's instilled and filled with this righteous cause. I know that Jesus Christ is king and that his kingdom must be established. And I'm going to go and announce it to the whole world. And in the midst of that, God makes you mighty. He makes you strong through fight. He makes you valiant because you are in the the midst of the throw of the thing with total abandonment. Hallelujah. That's where faith and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ almost become exact synonyms. By faith, they stop the mouths of lions. Because you look at the relationship that got Daniel into the lion's den in the first place. His unwavering commitment and love and consecration to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To quench the violence of fire, 
the unrelentless, unwaver, the relentless, huh, unwavering consecration of those three men. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, we're not bowing to you or to anything you've got. And you, you know the fear of it? Do you know the fear of it? It's far more than the fear of your bills. Huh? It's far more than the fear of just the things that most people commonly and casually deal with and seem to run completely hysterically screaming for the help of men. We're talking about a fire that's so hot you can, you can feel the heat of it two football fields away. Huh? You ever been in where a big fire is going off and the heat's upwards of 1,000 degrees? 2,000 degrees. You can feel the heat of that long ways on. You got your one last chance just to bow. And the resolve, the resolve, the, the manifestation of the truth of whether you're living in heaven or in earth, you're living out your own life or you're living out the life and the plan that God has given to you. It's all revealed in those moments. I'm yours, Father. I'm yours, whether I live or whether I die. I'm yours. It's easy to say, kind of just rolls off the tongue until you get yourself in the crisis. I'm yours. I'm going to meditate day and night so that I can be successful, so I can be strong, so I can be valiant. Huh? Lord, if you, when you're done with me here, I'm just happy to be there. Amen. I'm good. Now, all of a sudden, you don't need to give thought. All of a sudden, this is the context of not, not needing to give thought, thought for your food, what you should eat. Now, this is the context of not having to give thought for what you should wear. You're in the context now. I'm in the midst. I'm in the midst of the battle. I'm in the midst of the divine will. I'm in, in the midst of the purposes and the call of God upon my life. I don't have to concern myself with anything. Uh -huh. He'll take care of me. Praise his holy name. He's, he's, he's searching. He's not just scanning. He's searching. He's looking with squinted eyes. He's looking very closely, looking for someone whom he might show himself mighty on their behalf. That's Psalms 11, 4. Ezekiel 22, 30. The Lord says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and should stand in the gap before me for the land, for the people, for my inheritance. He's just talking about the church in that verse of Scripture. Not even talking about the world there. So I would not destroy it. But there was none. There was not an Abraham to say, no, don't do it, Father. There's ten righteous. There was not a Moses to say, no, don't do it. Begin with me. Here's why you can't do it. Because if you do it, people are going to say that you didn't have power enough, and I don't want anything to dishonor you. I don't want the sin of this people to result in a dishonoring of you. Your honor and your glory is more important to me than anything else. Jeremiah 5, 1. God says, run. Go run to and fro throughout the streets of Jerusalem. I mean, I can hear Father say this. Go run throughout the midst of the church. Right now, go run. See now. Look and know and seek in the broad places. See if you can find a man, any man, anyone who's in covenant relationship with me, who's in partnership with me, Who's, who is set, who's bent on doing my will. See if you can find any man, just one man, if there be just one that will execute my judgments, that will seek the truth, and I will pardon the entire land. I'll pardon the entire people. I'll pardon the entire nation. One. Just give me one. And they have one. All there was was the prophet prophesying. Here's what the Lord says. One man declaring. God says to Jeremiah, write the, go to Baruch. Write these words. Tell Baruch to write these things down, which I have purposed to do against this city and against this nation. For perhaps they will read and understand and will repent and will turn from their wickedness and I will forgive them and heal them. This is what he's saying. 
I'm just saying, I'm crying out to you people. There's got to be salt. There's got to be light. There's got to be an intercessor. We're in perilous times. Look, I hear the Lord Jesus telling me, he's saying to me, come apart with me into a solitary place. Why? Because he's got some things he wants to show some folks right now so we can do them. He's got some signs and some wonders that he wants to teach us. He wants to show us like he showed Moses. Put your hand in your garment. Now pull it out. It's leprous. Now put it back in. Now it's clean. Cast down. I'm going to show you another sign. I want, God wants to come to part with him into a solitary place and be alone with him so he can speak strength and power and might and understanding and insight into our lives so that we can begin to execute his will on a whole other realm. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to achieve it within human ability. All you can do is a loving heart, a response, obedience to the master. Say, use me, send me, I'm yours. Completely sold out. And there's one test after another. Yeah, he's sold out. God says to Abraham, today I know, I know that you're my friend. I know I've got a friend in the earth. I know I've got somebody, trust me. I know I have in someone that which I looked for in Adam and what he would not do. Dear people, Father's asking you to be his friend. He's made you his friend, and he's asking us, will we in turn be his friends? He's made us friends. He's called us friends. And will we in turn say, you're my friend? And then will we take the friendship on the level now? Of, of Father saying whatever he wants to say, asking of us whatever he wants to ask, and we don't, we don't fight it. We don't say, oh, no comprende. I don't understand. You just fall down and you do it. I'll do it, Father. I'm going. Yes, sir. Search me, oh God. Try me. Huh? <laughs> See if there'll be anything within me that would draw back. Come on now. You can't start way down the road in God. You have to start right here where you're at right now with the challenges you face right now. This is where you start. People imagine all kinds of things. Well, when I get here, when I have that, or is some cer- set of circumstances, then at that time, no, it's now, right now. What will you do now, right now, at this time? What is the response of your heart right now? What are the decisions you're making right now about what God has purposed and commanded us to do in his kingdom? That's, all, that's, what, all, that's what it's all about. Father, give you grace enough. He'll give you faith enough to follow him. And I don't even know where you're going. And he'll give you grace enough and faith enough to keep you all along the way and all the different challenges that you face. Hmm? And then he'll give you grace enough and faith enough to ultimately do the final thing that he asks you to do before he unleashes his glo- the full manifestation of his power and his glory through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not earned, it's established. not about proving you know our own ability it's, it's really about cleaving the decision of whether we're cleaving on him and loving him and what he wants is more important than what we want his will it's about his will and whether or not we're willing to let his will absolutely be established in our life to what degree his will now gets to totally rule and control our lives I want one last verse of scripture to, I want to read to you here Well, I got all these scriptures. I'm just going to pass them up. Get this one. This is me. This is, this is what Father, this promise is for everyone, but this is what Father promised me many years ago. In other words, I believe every one of us should let each verse of scripture in the Bible address us personally. But there's something that happens and the Lord makes it so real to us it's almost that it was written out for us. Even though we can theologically understand that it wasn't, and we can exegetically put it into place here and there and whatever. No, God does something that causes us to realize this is who you are, and this is what I'm going to do through you. I'm
I'm going to say this to you. God doesn't take anybody from obscurity. I mean, God doesn't take rather from me. God doesn't take anyone from the halls of greatness and make them great. God takes people from the places of total obscurity who are willing with total abandonment to serve him and walk with him who are small in their own eyes. It says to Saul, in the day that you were small in your own eyes, I took you and set you as king over my people, over my heritage. What happens to the process? Some people become, as Saul did, as Azza did, they become lifted up. The heart that is lifted up within a person is not right. Is it powerful then, you know, when you understand Habakkuk, in this context, Habakkuk chapter 2, but the righteous shall live by faith. Huh? Because this is always what's going on. Or is it going to be a relationship? Is it going to be your total commitment and trusting Father? Just, it's not about you. You're not doing it for yourself. It's all about the kingdom of God. And as you do this, Father says, listen, no one left houses and family and lands for my name's sake and for the kingdom except for he will receive so much more now in this life and in the life to come, everlasting life. I mean, that's the context. Father says, I'll bless you beyond your any possible ability to consider. I'll bless you beyond anything you could possibly ever think or ask. But here's, here's what you're going to have to understand. Here's what I'm looking for. This is, the only, this is the only way our relationship is going to work. I understand the enemy of your soul. I understand the things that could ruin you. Thus, you must be sold out completely and entirely to do my will, to do whatever I ask you to do it, whenever I ask you to do it. You never argue with me. You never, you never draw back. You never shrug it off. If you shrug off the man of God, you shrug off God. Whatever, however you treat the man of God is how you treat God. That's what the Lord says. However you treat even the least, among, least of those among you is how you treat me, says Jesus. You can't say you love God when you, whom you haven't seen and hate your brother whom you haven't seen. Father always pairs it down. How are you interacting with those around you? That's how you are interacting with me. And we don't like it that way. Because we like to dream rather than live. It's time to live now, man. It's time to stand up and live. Stand up and be numbered in the, in the, among the mighty. The Lord says, all you got to do is keep my charge. Do what I tell you to do. And I'll give you a place to come sit down among all these mighty ones who are gathered around here with me. Have you, has the Lord ever talked to you like that out of Zechariah chapter 3? You heard him say that to you? I heard the Lord say this to me. The Lord's full of promises for us. Every one of them are true. Every promise in the Bible belongs to you. You just need to get yourself in some tough situations so you can hear them directed to you from his own heart. Every tough situation I've ever been in is the places where these things were made so real to me. is what the Lord says and they that shall be of you shall build the old waste places you shall raise up the foundation of many generations that's culture changing come on man the only way culture is changed is you rise up against the culture that exists and says it cannot be it cannot continue No change. It's a law of the universe. Change does not come unless there is great catastrophe. It's a law of the universe. There has to be a violent explosion. There has to be a chaos. To bring change. A total disorder to bring order. Look at the chaos of the cross. Mm. 
what a revival meeting. Just imagine that you were standing near to the sacrifice that day. And when, when, when he was being smacked by the whip, some of the blood splattered over onto you. Imagine that church meeting. Imagine what that was like. Is everybody standing there cussing, cursing you, damning your soul, declaring you smitten, afflicted of God. That's the church meeting. And the lamb hangs. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. What a church meeting. Whew. That is the first church meeting of a great church meeting. That ever, the greatest church meeting that ever existed. The greatest revival meeting that ever took place. To bring men all the way back to that place that Adam walked away from. To step back in to the holies of holies through the veil of his very own flesh. Being torn apart, ripped apart so I could step in. Jesus' flesh being ripped apart so that through it I could step in to this place in divine power and glory. I care nothing for my life. I care nothing for my comfort. And God's calling people who would be that way. That he might make you mighty. Yes. Huh? That he may establish you on the earth. His eyes go to and fro. Who with total abandonment will serve me? Huh? Who will make up the gap? Who will make up, who will make up the hedge? Who will seek judgment and do that which is righteous? Who will do that which Father has commanded and willed for us to do? After he paid such a high price for our salvation, for our relationship with him. Who with total abandonment leave the pursuit of their own happiness and the pursuit of their own life and purpose to do what Father says to do. Even if it means for you a chopping block where your head's cut off. If it means for you poverty and affliction and torment and rejection to be sawed in tune to, to wander in the earth, to dwell in caves of whom this world is not worthy of. Go ahead, continue reading the book of faith. People stop short of those particular passages <laughs> folks have no even no concept theologically to even relate to suffering and losing the life and, and, and laying down their life for the, for the gospel in these days but I'll tell you right now it's where the glory's at it's where the glory's at <laughs> there's, there's no suffering in this present world right now that's worthy to be compared with the glory that's about to be revealed in you Huh? If you're persecuted and you take it patiently, then the grace of God, the glory of God rests upon you. Come on, man. Come on. It's to Father's talking about total abandonment. It's like get up from this place, get yourself a one-way ticket to somewhere where they've never heard the gospel and live out your life in glory. Come on, man. Huh? Quit sitting around waiting for another day when God's already told you what to do. Quit sitting around waiting for another word. And God's giving you a whole Bible full of words. Somebody come to me and say, oh, a, a, a prophet prophesied this word over me. It's like, big deal. God's done prophesied over you. Talk to me about that a little bit. Oh, the prophet said, what did Papa say? Who's bigger here? Who's more weighty in what he says here, the prophet or Papa? This is what we're going to do. And you should be called the repairer of the breach. Somebody said the breach is too great. The rebellion within the midst of the church is too great. Can't be repaired. No, I'm going to repair the breach. You say, well, I don't I think you're bragging. Well, why don't you brag? What are you going to do? I'm going to do the will of my father. Father's looking for people like this. And then Satan wants to come along and bully and condemn those who say, I lay hold on it. I'll do it. The prince in the power of the air that is able to speak in the minds of so many people that should be only hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost. Come on now. Dear people. Somebody said, what do you make yourself? I make myself Nothing. What, it was wrong question. What has God made you? Who do you think you are? Wrong question. Who does God think you are? 
I look at people from now and say, who does God think you are? <laughs> and then you go ahead and ask your, answer your own question or get a confession of faith out of them, one of the two. <laughs> Come on, man. It's time for us to build each other up in the most holy faith, to encourage ourselves to go do mighty things yes. in God. Huh? Yes. Huh? The kingdom of darkness is like a bunch of crabs in a bucket. Are you with me? Are you with me? Everybody's in the kingdom of darkness like a bunch of crabs in a bucket. As soon as one crab starts to get out, the other crabs reach up and drag them back in. Hey, put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and watch them act. Huh? One crab's about to get out. Watch it. They don't get out. Huh? Because Satan goes about his roaring lion seeking whom, may, whom he may devour. Father's eyes go to and fro. Seeking whom he may empower. I'm going to say, Papa, empower me right now. I'll do, I'll do it. Huh? I'll do it. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll be whatever you want me to be. And you start doing it then. Huh? You walk around the house and say, Papa, I don't need this bed. I don't need that pillow. I don't need that couch. I don't need this kitchen. I don't need this. I thank you that you gave it to me. You blessed me. I don't need it. I want it. All I need is you. Whatever you want me to do. Thank you. I thank you for it. I'm blessed by it, but I don't need that. I don't need that. Hallelujah. I believe that these are days where we're going to stop seeing so many people just focus on doing the same routine of running the churches because there needs to be a new voice to begin with. It needs to be a call of repentance. And a lot of people are going to hit the place, they hit the mission field where the gospel hasn't even been preached one time. Huh? The offerings will be much smaller and of a different sort. Huh? Chicken and egg. Huh? pair of moccasins of different types homemade shoes in other words from that culture but the life will be great huh huh praying high isn't known for who he was and is not going to be heard. his name is not going to be heard throughout the histories of the church throughout the ages because he sits somewhere complaining about how things didn't work out for him in ministry nobody wanted to listen to him preach he just went to India and cried out to God, God, you give me India or I'm going to die. I must have India. I must have this nation. And he gave himself to a life of crying out to God, prayer, and, and living in, in abject poverty in India. Because he didn't have no backing. And nobody. And the, church, the church builds a sepulcher. Stones of prophets and builds a sepulcher. Okay? He didn't have no backing when he went. And nobody supporting him. Nobody believed in his ministry. He alone believed in his, him and Jesus. The only ones believed in his ministry. Now it's too late, everybody. Wow. Huh? Pray and hide. You got to die before you can, everybody's, anybody's going to like you. <laughs> Come on, baby. My, my dear wife said to me the other day, she said, pastoring is the hardest job in the kingdom of God. But evangelists say the same thing. Evangelists say that evangelism is the hardest job in the kingdom of God. No, it's not. Anywhere Jesus is, it's beautiful. It just, you can't get lost, caught up in all the things that people are caught up in saying, doing. You can't matter. Not even your own life also. The Lord says, he put that in number. In, in, my, in the comparison of my love for him, I hate my own life also. So what I want, I, I, I enjoy being on a horse, pushing cows around, walk, just riding around, looking at them, make sure nobody's got a runny nose. <laughs> and if they do, fix them. Going through the woods, hunting. I love that stuff. Getting on the tractor. 
scraping up the land, put more seed in it so the hay grows richer and taller. And I, 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 that's, that's what I would do with my life. I was, uh, I was being interviewed for medical school, and they said, well, if you were rich and wealthy and had all the money in the world, what would you do? And I knew what the answer was supposed to be. Duh. <laughs> the answer is supposed to be I would be a doctor, right? I said, I'd be farmer. <laughs> and the guy... And, of course, I knew exactly what the guy was going to say. But I was just going to be honest. What would you do? I'm not going to give him the answer he wants to. I'm going to tell you what I'd do. I'd be a farmer. If it didn't matter, I'd be a farmer. I'd be a rancher. People don't like the outside until all of a sudden they don't have any food to eat in the grocery store. Then they love the outside. Then they <laughs> dig it in the dirt. <laughs> Are you with me? And you're like, yeah, you're, you're like <laughs> getting this great affection for water, for dirt, for trees, for things that crawl around on the ground. You have a great desire for them to, to fry them up and eat them. <laughs> but I found something far better. And it's wherever Papa wants me to be. Come on, just do this. Engage. The concerns that you've had, the relationship problems that you have, They'll all just vanish because they were all phantoms anyways. They are all spoofs. They were all make-believes. They were all imaginations. They're all things that you created in your own mind. Your need for this and your need for that. Just gone. It vanishes. Jesus is calling. He's tenderly calling. Calling for you and for me. He stands on the portal. He's waiting. He's watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home. You who are weary, come home. Tenderly. Softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. It's beautiful. It's true. He's saying, here I am. It's up to you. What will you do with your life? Will you spend it on me? Will you spend it on my kingdom? Will you spend it on doing the will of the Father or will you spend it on you? Would you stand with me? Father, we say to you right now, because of the grace that you've given, we spend our life on you. Father, we say to you, here we are with all of our problems, with all of our failures, with all of our shortcomings, with all of our doubts. Lord, we say we come to you and we say, Father, everything about our life, we thank you that you change us completely and entirely, that you strengthen, and you strengthen us, you give us, you strengthen our bodies to stand against sickness and disease, our spirits to stand against sin and iniquity our souls to be strong and having only a love and affection and passion for you. Father, we give ourselves to doing those things that you've commissioned us to do. Father, we thank you that you've taken this church and you've taken our lives and you make this church a place to restore the, pa to restore the dwellings in a place of being overwhelmed with your glory and doing your will that we may be called restorers of the paths to dwell in. The breach that exists between man and you, between your church and you, to repair it, to live out a life, oh God, standing in the gap of seeking judgment, seeking righteousness, seeking your will. Father, tonight, today, right now, at this moment in time, I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this place will with total and complete surrender begin to offer their bodies and their lives a living sacrifice to you. Not to live another day trying to get their head above water. Not to live another day for self-interest trying to mitigate the damage. Trying to fight their way out of the problems that they've gotten themselves into. But they'll recognize that it's the snare of Satan. It's the power of deception. And with total abandonment, they'll turn their back on it and walk away and follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. 
The mantle of God's divine power and grace is upon you. He's called you and He's appointed you for this day and for this hour. For this time, for this, this circumstance, for these unique set of situations that exist in this generation. And as long as you're paralyzed by fear and imprisoned in your jobs, and imprisoned in your own life, you can never be the remedy that God raised you up to be. The cure that God made you to be. But if you'll walk away this day with total abandonment, no matter what the fear, no matter what the problem, no matter what the situation may be, no matter what the hindrance may seem to be, no matter how big the giant may seem to be, you'll stand up and say, Father, I want your will to be done in my life. I want to live for the purpose that I was created to live for. In this time, this day, in this hour, the Father will cause His grace upon, to dwell upon you and He'll take you from one place to the next place and you'll find yourself burning with the brightness of His glory, burning with the brightness of His purpose and of His fire in this earth. And you'll be everything that God has ordained you to be. Your life would have counted and you'll be able to say with great confidence, Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which could not fade away because I've run my race, I've fought the fight, kept the faith. Let me just say this to you. This ministry, the Abiding Place Ministry, has made a transition. And this ministry will begin now to step into fulfilling the will of the Father on a higher level of expression, in a higher degree of His manifested will. So these things that I described to you about Isaiah 58, 12, will become far more measurable. So far as I'm concerned, they're greatly measurable now. That which God has done, no man could do. But Father is going to begin to do a work in the midst of the people who are desperate for Him. We'll stand in the, in, in, in the heat of the battle that will cause all sincere hearts, in, forgive me, all insincere hearts to run away in fear and terror. We'll stand where other men will not even be able to stand for only those who have been tried in the fiery furnace of faith and established in this love and trust. Only that consecration will be able to stand here only that commitment will be able to deal with the offense and the opposition <laughs> but there in the midst of that glory Christ Jesus will be fully revealed the heart of the king will be turned to God the heart of a nation will be turned back to its consecration because there's somebody who's bridging the gap, standing in the hedge, repairing the breach, taking up the cause. That all we want as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to burn with the beauty and the splendor of His divine power and glory that the Holy Spirit has full liberty and control to reveal Jesus. And I'm telling you, I feel no resistance to this at all. There may be one or two that you haven't been in enough church meetings over the years to be able to have the ability and the strength to say yes to this because it takes ability and strength that only God can give to even say yes to this kind of message. That's why you need to be in church all the time. So you can be built up in the faith. So that when God speaks, you move. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I see Father taking your life. Every one of you. I see Father, every one of you that are willing. Every person consecrated. Everybody says, I'm not holding back. I see Father taking your life and using you beyond anything you can imagine.
This is why the Lord says, despise not the day of small things. That's why he says in that context that his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth. Despise not the day of small things because there's those moments of testing and there's those moments of examination. There's those moments of the evaluation of motive. <laughs> the, com- the conformity of will. More than anything, more than people needing to hear a sermon, they need to see a sermon. When your life is a sermon, all you got to do is stand up and declare those things that are happening in your life. In God. All you got to do is get up and declare and describe the consecration and the call that your heart is surrendered to. That's what, that's, what, that's what needs to be heard. A description of what it means to have the life of Jesus living on the inside. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we consecrate ourselves to doing your will. To going everywhere preaching the gospel, no matter what that looks like. Whether it's just here, or whether it's everywhere throughout the entirety of the world, it matters not. Your will, Father, God alone is all that matters. Whether we're holding up the arms of the ministry, or whether we're standing on the platform ourselves, it does not matter. So long as our all is completely submitted to your will. I want you to say this with me. Say, Lord, I submit my all to your will. Lord Jesus, I lay down my life. I deny myself. I take up my cross cross. and follow you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the the opportunity. opportunity. Strengthen me, O God, God. that I do not fail. fail. Strengthen me, O God, God. that in every way way I fulfill your will will and plan. For my life. For that is all that I desire. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Authority to go everywhere and conquer. Authority to go everywhere and see the transformation of people's lives. The will of the Father executed. The things of the kingdom of God seen and witnessed by mighty signs and wonders and miracles. Demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. Where every mind blinding spirit is stopped. The eyes of every human being can see the glory of this love of Jesus Christ. Amen. This goodness of God. Amen. We praise the Lord. Praise His name. Hallelujah. Listen, you know, in this this atmosphere of worship, as you're just worshiping the Lord and consecrating your whole life and will and purpose to Him, this is the atmosphere of giving. And the Lord has hooked up a realm of faith with giving that you can't separate the two out. Because if you hold on to those things, uh, your finances, the things that the Lord has given you, hold them on, on to them because you put and you trust in them.
because you need them for all these other purposes. There's only one way to break that thing. Is let it go and put it in the hands of Father. Because here's what he said. He said, I, you know, he knows that you got bills to pay. you got things you got to get done financially. He knows that. He's, he's already promised to provide for you all that you have need of. According to his riches and glory. You see. So he says, listen, don't worry. Here's what I'm going to do. Understand. You give a little bit and I'm going to give you a little bit. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a little bit. I'll make it up to you. Because I'm going to tell you when, you, when you talk about a little bit of harvest, it's still more than what you started with. Let me say it again. When you talk about a little bit of harvest, it's still more than what you started with. Can I say that again? You want me to say it again? It's not that he returns your money. When you, give a, when, you, when you get a little bit of harvest, it's still more than what you started with. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Because you sow seed and it multiplies every time. If you get any harvest, it's more than what you started with. He said, but if you give a lot, I'm going to give you a bigger harvest. I'm going to give you a lot. I'm going to give you a bigger harvest. Because Father has told us, and when you go and you read Isaiah chapter 58, you read, for example, Ezekiel chapter 22, you see the problem by and large. What Father was bringing his judgment down on was the fact that people had given themselves over to, sin, to such sin and such it turned so to their own way that now everything about society had come undone. They weren't taking care of the orphans. They weren't taking care of the widows. They weren't, they were, it was social injustices more than anything else. The way people were treating other people, their neighbor, more than anything else. Isaiah 58, Ezekiel 22. You see Father do that over and again. Say those kinds of things over and again. Father's purpose that we take care of the orphans. Are you listening? We take care of the widows. We take care of the poor. We take care of traveling ministry. And we take care of the local church. That's what he's purposed. Paul was a Paul, for example, of a traveling minister. And uh, you, there's everybody in here. You could stand up and, and expect great things and great harvest. I, I, where's Rob at? Are people out of town? I just really wanted to, somebody to, to vouchsafe me in this. But I believe that we give as a church right at about 30% of all of our income. Because we want, we want to set as a precedence what we believe people should be doing. You know, Papa, I mean, I tell you right now, so many times we give when we don't have it. Just give. And um, Father's always faithful to do what he says he's going to do. Has there, been, has there been some situations where it looked challenging? Did it look like, really, if you measured it, did it really look like that it was what Father said? Yeah, but those are lies. It's not truth. It's a misevaluation. It's a misunderstanding of, of what really, went, what really went and happened. Your perception is not more accurate than God's word. We said, well, I just counted up. Well, you counted it up in a short window of time on the basis of what you understand. You quantified things that you understood. There's far, 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 far more. But I'm going to tell you right now, Papa has made it on the level of monetizing it as well. You can, you can move into this realm of faith. Yes. Hallelujah. And I just want you to continue to do it. I want you to honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first fruits of you increase, I don't want you to ever forsake your, the, the, the actual worship with tithe, one-tenth of all the Father blesses you with. Somebody say, well, if I gave it, you know, if I begin to give a tenth of what I have been given or what I've, you know, people look at it different. They look at it like what I have earned, you know, you've been given, okay? Then we're not going to have enough to eat. I'm sure you won't with that attitude. Because that doubt did not please God. That doubt will not result in a miracle of God. Are you with me? That doubt is not trust. Uh, if we do this, we're not going to be able to do that. Well, that is anti-Christ. That's anti-word. You're going to have to cast down that imagination. Because that was in the realm of logic and rational thinking based upon uh, eliminating God from the equation. Did you know that man made that? Man purposed in his heart. 
that we're going to understand all the creative world by eliminating God from the equation. It's the enlightenment. <laughs> Boy, is that ever a misnomer? But when you set Father right in the midst of the equation, and His Word absolutely is truth, certainty, that which you know will happen and take place. And you just do, you're then, you, know what, you, you know what happens? You get liberated. You get free to obey God. And you just stand there and obey God. And whatever He tells you to do, you can do it. Because now it ain't about, and on the basis of, of fear. You don't do what you do on the basis of fear and doubt and worry and what the money in the bank account says and on and on. It's great freedom. It's a great liberty. Amen. Well, come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. Find people around you. Hug them. Bless them. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that you're glad to see them. If you're not glad to see them, repent. If you don't love them, repent. Then tell them that you're glad to see them and that you love them. Okay? And hey, la mosicaya. Oh, we're having a baptism next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're having a baptism. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, anybody you know needs to get baptized, get them here. If you know people that need to get baptized that aren't saved yet, get them saved and so that they can get baptized next Sunday. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>